Hello everyone, welcome to Yellow Pages Nursing. In today's session, we will be discussing about appendicitis in detail. Before entering into the session, if you have not subscribed our channel, please subscribe our channel and do not forget to hit the bell icon to receive instant notifications. Let's get into the topic. Now, let's have a look on anatomy of appendix. Appendix is located in the lower right side of the abdomen. As we all know, large intestine has four sections, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and sigmoid colon. The appendix is a small finger-like appendage about 10 cm long that is attached to the cecum just below the ileocecal valve. Appendix is also called vermiform appendix because it resembles the shape of a worm. Let's have a look at an important landmark called McBurney's point. McBurney's point is located one third of the distance from right anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. This corresponds to the location at the base of the appendix. Let's discuss about blood supply to the appendix. The appendix is supplied by the appendicular artery. The venous blood drains through the corresponding veins into the superior mesenteric vein. The appendicular vein is the vein which drains blood from the vermiform appendix. It is located in the meso appendix and accompanies the appendicular artery. Now, let's begin with the disease condition. Appendicitis. Appendicitis is defined as an inflammation of the appendix and it's the most common major surgical emergency. Usually, the appendix fills with food and empties regularly into the cecum. The appendix is prone to obstruction and is particularly vulnerable to develop appendicitis because it empties inefficiently and its lumen is small. Prevalence of appendicitis About 7% of the population will have appendicitis at some time in their lives. It's more commonly seen in males, teenagers and between the ages of 10 and 30 years. Next comes causes of appendicitis. First comes infection. Infection, possibly stomach infection that has traveled to the site of appendix. It's commonly caused by bacteria, virus, parasites in the digestive tract. Next is tumors. Next causes fecalith, that is hard stony mass of feces in the intestinal tract. This can obstruct the appendix and leads to appendicitis. Next cause is fecal impaction. A layered buildup of calcium salts and fecal debris around a piece of fecal material within the appendix. Next cause is lymphoid hyperplasia. The appendix contains lymphoid tissue that can become inflamed as a result of infection or inflammatory bowel disease. Next cause is foreign material. A wide variety of foreign objects can become lodged into the appendix. Some of these include shotgun pellets, intrauterine devices, tungstats, etc. Let's look into the pathophysiology. Due to etiological factors, there is inflammation and ulceration that obstructs the appendix. This increases intraluminal pressure and the appendix contracts. Here, the bacteria multiplies and causes inflammation. Also, the intraluminal pressure continues to increase, affecting blood flow to the organ and causing severe abdominal pain. This impaired blood flow results in ischemia, which further causes necrosis, gangrenous appendicitis, perforation, and peritonitis. This image clearly shows the difference between a normal appendix and an inflamed appendix. Here, there is fecal deposits which causes inflammation, mucus outflow is blocked, and the intraluminal pressure is also increased. Now, types of appendicitis. There are two types, acute appendicitis and chronic appendicitis. Acute appendicitis is the most common one and has more severe symptoms. This appears suddenly within 24 to 48 hours and requires immediate treatment. Chronic appendicitis is rare and have milder symptoms that last for a long time and disappear and reappear. It can go undiagnosed for several weeks, months or years. Next comes clinical manifestations of appendicitis. 
First comes pain with low grade fever. Vague epigastric or peri umbilical pain progresses to right lower quadrant pain. The pain may feel like a cramp at first and it may get worse when you cough, sneeze or move. Other symptoms include anorexia, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, constipation or diarrhea, flatulence. And coming to classical sign of appendicitis, there is tenderness at McBurney's point. The location of McBurney's point we have already discussed in the previous slide. There is deep tenderness at McBurney's point known as McBurney's sign and it's a classical sign of acute appendicitis. Next comes Aron's sign. Aron's sign is a referral pain felt in the epigastrium upon continuous firm pressure over McBurney's point. Next comes rebound tenderness also known as Blumberg's sign. This refers to the presence of pain when pressure is removed from the abdomen rather than when applied. The image is for your reference to understand the symptom more clearly. Next comes Rosing's sign. Rosing's sign refers to the pain felt in the right lower abdomen upon palpation of the left side of the abdomen. A positive rosing sign is an indication of acute appendicitis characterized by inflammation, infection or swelling of the appendix. Next is obdurator sign. It is defined as discomfort felt by the subject or patient on the slow internal movement of the hip joint while the right knee is flexed. Next sign is psoas sign. Psoas sign is elicited by having the patient lie on his or her left side while the right thigh is flexed backward. Pain may indicate an inflamed appendix overlying the psoas muscle. Next comes Dunphy's sign. Dunphy's sign is a medical sign characterized by increased abdominal pain with coughing. It may be an indicator of appendicitis. All of these classical signs so far we have discussed can be seen during physical examination. Next comes diagnostic evaluation. Diagnosis is based on results of a complete physical examination and on laboratory findings and imaging studies. In physical examination, we have already discussed about the classical signs. In laboratory findings, blood test shows increased WBC count, increased neutrophils and increased C-reactive protein. And in urine tests, a higher percentage of ketone bodies in urine with appendicitis may be associated with starvation secondary to anorexia, which is one of the common symptoms of appendicitis. In imaging studies, CT or MRI is done. In CT scan, dilated appendix with distended lumen more than 6 mm diameter can be found. Next comes abdominal ultrasound. In abdominal ultrasound, a peristaltic non-compressible dilated appendix more than 6 mm outer diameter is found. It also helps to find periappendicial fluid collection or enlargement. Next comes abdominal x-ray. Standard x-rays of the abdomen are often performed, but in only about 10% of cases are they able to pinpoint a diagnosis of appendicitis. Next comes diagnostic laparoscopy. A diagnostic laparoscopy may be used to rule out acute appendicitis in equivocal cases. Pregnancy tests may be performed for women of childbearing age to rule out ectopic pregnancy and before x-rays are obtained. Next comes Alvarado score. The Alvarado score is a clinical scoring system used in the diagnosis of appendicitis. Scoring is based on symptoms, signs and laboratory findings. First is pain. Abdominal pain that migrates to the right iliac fossa carries score 1. Anorexia or ketones in the urine carries score 1. Nausea or vomiting carries 1. Tenderness in the right iliac fossa carries score 2. In signs, rebound tenderness or Blumberg sign carries score 1. Fever of 37.3 degrees Celsius or more carries score 1. In laboratory findings, leukocytosis more than 10,000 carries score 2. And neutrophilia more than 70% carries score 1. So, a total of score 10 is given. 
and the interpretation is given as follows if the score is less than 5 it indicates not sure and to keep under observation if the score is 5 to 6 it is compatible maybe for regular observation if the score is between 6 to 9 it is probable and should be operated and if the score is more than 9 it is confirmed and has to be operated next comes complication the major complication is perforation of the appendix which can lead to peritonitis or an abscess Perforation generally occurs 24 hours after onset of pain. Symptoms include fever 37.7 degrees Celsius or 100 degree Fahrenheit or greater, toxic appearance and continued pain and tenderness. Now coming to management of appendicitis, there are medical management, surgical management and nursing management. In medical management, IV fluids are given. IV fluids are given to correct fluid and electrolyte imbalance and dehydration. IV fluids are administered before the surgery. Next are antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics are administered to prevent sepsis. And next comes analgesics to control pain. In surgical management, open appendectomy or laparotomy, laparoscopy appendectomy and drainage is done. A laparoscopic appendectomy is a minimally invasive surgery to remove the appendix through several small incisions rather than through open appendectomy or laparotomy. In recent times, laparoscopic appendectomy is the most common surgical management for appendicitis. Next coming to drainage, abdominal drains are not necessary after laparoscopic appendectomy for uncomplicated acute appendicitis. In cases of perforated acute appendicitis, the use of abdominal drains should be selective according to intraoperative findings, degree of peritonitis or presence of intra-abdominal abscesses. Next coming to nursing management of appendicitis, there is pre-operative nursing management and post-operative nursing management. Let's discuss pre-operative nursing management. First comes assessment of pain. Assess for location, characteristic and severity of pain. Next, provide semi fowler's position. This is done in order to reduce pain and collect the exudates into the lower abdomen, relieving the abdominal tension. Next, monitor vital signs hourly. Monitor bowel sounds. Maintain the patient on nilpair oral status. Administer fluids intravenously to prevent dehydration. Administer antibiotics, analgesics, and antipyretics as prescribed. Monitor signs of peritonitis. This includes increased heart rate, increased respiration, increased temperature, and abdominal pain and distension or bloating. Next comes avoid laxatives or enema because they may lead to perforation. Avoid application of heat in the abdomen which may increase the risk of rupture. Apply ice pack to the abdomen as prescribed to reduce pain. Complete all the investigations as prescribed before the surgery. Next comes post-operative nursing management. First comes assessment of pain. Assess for location, characteristics and severity of pain. Next, provide high fowler's position for the patient. This position reduces tension on the incision and abdominal organs, helping to reduce pain. Next, monitor vital signs and signs of infection. Example, rise in temperature. Next, monitor bowel sounds. Preoperatively, there is diminished or no bowel sounds, and later after surgery, 2-3 to three days after, bowel sounds develop and if not present inform it to the physician next provide oral fluids and diet as prescribed check the incision area for redness or purulent drainage ambulate the patient provide incentive spirometer help in coughing and deep breathing exercise all these will prevent blood clots and developing pneumonia Administer IV fluids and antibiotics as prescribed in order to provide hydration and prevent infection. Maintain the drain after surgery if present. 
Next comes discharge teaching for the patient. During discharge, the nurse on duty should educate the following to the patient. Patient should report to the physician if surgical wound has increased swelling, redness, drainage, order or separation of the wound edges, if there is increased temperature or pain, and if there is signs of peritonitis as discussed before. Educate about care for the incision and perform dressing changes and irrigations as prescribed. Heavy lifting is to be avoided post-operatively, although normal activity can usually be resumed within 2-4 to four weeks. Next comes nursing diagnosis. Primary preoperative nursing diagnosis include acute pain related to inflammation. Primary postoperative nursing diagnosis includes risk for infection related to the surgical incision. Other diagnosis includes imbalanced nutrition less than body requirement, ineffective tissue perfusion, risk for deficient fluid volume, risk for injury. So here you go with this is condition on appendicitis. If you have any suggestions on discussing further disease conditions, please mention it on the comment box. If you find this video useful, please like it, share it and subscribe it and do not forget to hit the bell icon to receive instant notifications. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.